Hey there, ho there, this is, uh, 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 yeah, Nuts and Bolts, where we take a look behind the scenes of some of your favorite episodes of Anime Abandoned's Past. Well, I've been feeling under the weather recently, so I've decided to take the month off to rest these weary bones of mine. But that doesn't mean I'm going to leave you all high and dry, so let's delve right in with probably the intro to kind of tackle the issue I had with uh, people saying that, oh, you make these anime reviews too serious sometimes. So I just wanted to kind of poke fun at that a little bit and lead you guys on with this fake intro and then launch right into what is probably my most requested anime to review from every single old Taku that has ever watched the show from like day one. Like they've marked their calendars. Eventually he's going to talk about empty Geist. I mean, there's no way you can't. And yeah, uh, which, you know, the funny thing is, is that when this episode came out, I really have the feeling like you hid this intro from me. I know we, I know I was in the room when we wrote it, but I forgot about it. <laughs> and I was nowhere to be found during the edit. So when it was finally like done, done, I'm like, what the fuck is this? What's going on? <laughs> what have we done? What did Bennett do? <laughs> and then the reveal happened like, oh, oh, you got me. Just shows how astute a script supervisor you are. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, by the by, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mark, the engineer here is a, a script supervisor of mine, which means that he basically makes sure that what I say in the review is as factually accurate as possible and actually plays well to an audience outside of my head. Oh, no, don't put the fact checking on me. That's... Oh, come on. No, my, my job is to help write jokes and make jokes better. We just call it script supervisor because it's easier than just saying special thanks, and I was tired of special thanks showing up on my IMDb page. <laughs> so this is basically union work. Oh, God. <clears throat> uh, so first and foremost, anyone who knows anything about MD Geist knows that the original cut of MD Geist was just a mess. There were animation mistakes left and right. There were numerous, numerous uh, instances where you could see that the, the layers of the cell... If you know anything about animation, that uh, they animate on a cell by cell basis, that uh, the cells were misaligned during action scenes. So, like, uh, there's a one particular shot where uh, Guy's head just flaps around in a breeze, <laughs> like he was rattling around like a pain shaker. And uh, and this guy, John O'Donnell, loved this anime. Oh, I love that shot too. But uh, John O'Donnell, uh, the uh, who was in that photo montage just earlier, uh, loved this series so much and we still don't know why he loves this series so much but spent actual money not only getting this uh ova over to the states i think six years after it premiered in 1986 so 92 yeah about six years but actually paid to have it restored and correct some of the animation mistakes and paid their own employee and he paid his own employees to correct the digital uh mistakes and uh, my thinking about that is, wow, you paid all of that and you still couldn't fix every single mistake. Yeah, There's... because because the rule of thumb is it's always best to do it right the first time or else, you know, you need a an infinite wellspring of money to make it look OK or make it look the way that it was intended. Like, say, Akira for the two different anniversary releases. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those times where you wonder where what else could that money be spent on other than this freaking anime and uh and, like reading the uh reading the history of john o'donnell is actually kind of reading the uh well it's basically like reading the biography of uh duke phillips from the critic <laughs> <laughs> he did he was not the most liked man among his employees we're not going to name names of course but uh, there have been stories surrounding about this guy and uh it, none of the stories are good. Not one. Yeah, so in case you want a piece of anime history, just Google it. Yeah, it, it's uh, the history. I mean, like it, these stories aren't like their private knowledge or anything like that. The, I think if you've gone to one convention with any one of these uh, old school lifers uh, that were part of Central Park Media back in the day, they'll be happily tell you about like, oh, let me tell you about this story about freaking John O'Donnell. All right, I, I don't, I don't think it's I don't think it's that angry. It's just kind of like a yeah, I used to work for a supervillain. <laughs> and not even a cool supervillain like Goldfinger, more like Gold Member. Yep. Uh, yep. Hi-oh. Anyway. Oh, God. 
I remember you had specifically mentioned that you wanted to put that SWAT cats. I, I want to squeeze SWAT cats references into everything. They're awesome. <laughs> Anytime you see like this out there reference to like some forgotten '90s cartoon show, specifically Hanna are. Barbera, and we will get a Pirates of Dark Water reference in there somewhere eventually. <laughs> Chances are it's Mark's doing. <laughs> oh, I love. <laughs> yeah, it, did. it was a great shot too. Uh, this was actually added uh, to the uh, to the special edition of the first volume of MD Geist. If you got the VHS tape, this was not there at all. And uh, I have to think that, all right, you paid the Japanese animators to put additional scenes into the original se into the original series, and they still don't add anything to it, really. Not really. No, it's a, like it's just about it was just about adding to the Legend of MD Geist, the most you know fucked up anime you'd ever heard about in middle school. I wouldn't say it's like like, all right, I'll be the first one to say that the legends surrounding it are mostly out of proportion, and. Uh, I think it's, like I said, it's just because that Central Park Media used this anime as their flagship title. So it just became the most well-known of the shittiest anime that Central Park Media put out. And trust me, it's not nearly the shittiest. Garzy's Wing is still ten times worse. <laughs> it is! Garzy's Wing is sillier than MD Geist, I'll, granted, but it's also the more boring. I mean, yeah, which, like, I mean, the ultimate sin of this movie is that it, it really is, you know, it, it paints a picture of what anime used to be. It paints the picture that, you know, parents groups were kind of right. Um, the the pro like it, it was the, just the fact that it was so fucking visible at the time, you know, that you just couldn't get around like, no, look, Sailor Moon or Samurai Pizza Cats. Nope. MD guys, look at this shit. Look at it. It's bad for your kids. I, in this case, I would agree with the parents. I don't believe it. No one should watch MD Geist. It's, it's harmful to everyone who watches it. Hey, man. I'm, I'm absolutely... One day I'll have children, I'm sure, and I'm going to show them all this stuff because it turned me into such a great human being. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to repeat the formula. That's all. Uh, I was actually um, on a whim. I actually read as many articles as I could about the making of the original uh, MD Geist. And uh, hearing about it is, uh, or actually rather reading about it, is uh, sort of like reading what would happen if the ultimate fanboy got in way over his head on a project. You know, because... just, just so we're clear, I want to say that that backdrop looks absolutely recycled from Fist of the North Star. It probably was. <laughs> and that's what I was talking about, because uh, this uh, this was directed by a first time animation director, anime director. I think he worked on as a storyboard artist in, before he worked as a director. But uh, this was his first time directing. He had no real idea of what. Oh, speaking of this in the North Star, but uh, he had no real idea of what he wanted the story to be or what he wanted it to be about. He just knew that he wanted to basically homage and reference all these things that he loved, which was Fist of the North Star, which was uh, Mad Max, and uh, that's about it. So he, so this is sort of the reason why pretty much the story is a complete mess, because there really wasn't a story to speak of. It was just like homage upon homage upon homage. And secondly, he had no idea what he was doing. And hence all the animation mistakes, how... And, oh, uh, here, here's something, just to interrupt. Yeah. Originally, it wasn't supposed to be Bennett doing the Faye voice. We were going to get one of our actress friends to do it, but she was busy. It was going to be no acting. But yeah. sadly, she was too busy to do it, and I have to endure this crap-ass Faye voice, which I am officially boycotting. I know, like, you you have this... I, I, I was about to say irrational. No, no, it's rational hatred of men putting on Faye voices. And uh, thank God for Bob's Burgers figuring out that you could, a man could do a woman's voice without doing this. You yeah. just have to uh, experiment a little bit. But uh, back to the uh, back to the making of. <laughs> I well, I, I just think that this entire sequence of thoughts was us just trying to break down any MD guys fan. Like, here's your hero. He's extremely gay. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, it's like it's like so many friggin' like hardcore chauvinistic metalheads rocking like rocking all of the stuff in the halford look and then halford comes out as gay and they have to make that choice like am i still a metalhead if halford's gay well if halford's gay then that means gay is metal so yes <laughs> <laughs> well it just means that particular branch of uh, metal is uh, <laughs> pretty pretty gay not everyone can be hell bent for leather <laughs> 
or bent over leather, as it were. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to finish up the little story behind the scenes story by uh, talking about the fact that there was a near mutiny among the staff of this project. <laughs> They were so fed up with the lack of leadership that uh, they, like I said, they almost mutinied. And I and I wonder, like, what kept them together? Like, what was like the voice of reason? Is like, no, man, we came this far. We're gonna finish this piece of shit. Yeah. What did What did the rallying speech for that sound like? Because I'm fairly certain it wasn't gonna be friggin' Pullman's speech from Independence Day at all. No, I'm reminded of that Patton Oswalt bit where he was talking about the guy who managed to finish the script to a uh, deathbed, the bed that eats people. <laughs> like, no, I will finish this. I will finish when I start. Like, yes, this, this anime is completely motionless. It's directionless. We have no idea how we're going to end it. In fact, we're going to have a cliffhanger smack in the middle of it that no one's going to be able to figure out what happens next. Geist is going to change and no one's going to care and we are going to finish this because we started it and for no other reason! Are you with me? And everybody's just kind of sitting around like, I I just got to see how this ends. (laughs) Also, uh, this right here, right here, this was uh, done in post, uh, that digital zoom over to this captain to mask the fact that this was basically a static shot with nothing going on. Now, I ask you, Mark, which do you prefer? This obvious digital zoom or just nothing going on in frame? Well, see, this like at the time, crap ass digital zooms didn't really make all that much of a difference because CRT TVs weren't, you know, weren't they just weren't high definition. So you never really noticed that everything was getting pixelated and shitty because everything was just a baseline equal amount of shit. But now, in the high-definition age, crap like that, you simply can't get away with it anymore. You know, like, we start with 480, and then we scale it up to 720, and then we're scale- and then we're zooming on top of that. So, I think that at the time, it, it probably looked good in the editing bay. But, you know, ultimately, it comes... Because, I mean, this, this release came out before high-definition was still a thing. So, yeah, it's... It was one of the very first uh, DVD uh, anime to ever to be put to DVD over here. Not the first, but one of. Yeah, you know, like it's it's the argument about um, uh, about like linear gradients in old school games, where on CRTs they you know like they were all washed, so they looked exactly as intended. But in high definition on emulator or in ports, um, you can see all the levels of the gradient, and it doesn't look as good. You know, like is that the like that was. You know, that's the fault of the newer technology, not the technology the artists at the time. Well, I, I guess there is something to be said about the fact that uh, th- as technology progresses, the uh, <laughs> the sins of the past become more and more apparent. Uh, like how many times, like how many times did you rewatch something from when you from when you were younger? And then now you noticed like, oh, that's obviously held together by strings. Like, oh, yeah, they obviously did this. I mean, is that really so much the fault of the uh, the, te- the technology at the time as compared to then or just your uh, more mature eye? Well, it's it's always going to be a mixture of the two. I mean, think about the assault scene in friggin Tank Girl. Where, you know, even in theaters, you could see those wires that, you know, like all the kangaroo dudes were, you know, jumping around on because they didn't manage to remove them all in post. But, you know, in high definition, it gets that much freaking worse. You know, like at least, you know, when somebody when that first happened and somebody watched that cut and said, shit, we forgot, you know, at least they could say it's like, ah, well, you know, it's all going by so quickly. Maybe they won't notice or it's not this glaring omission. But, you know, Tank Girl makes the DVD, Tank Girl makes the Blu-ray, and it just gets worse per transfer. Th- oh, oh <laughs> favorite shot! <laughs> I this, believe this, was, was... this was absolutely... I was sitting by listening to Bennett go over the footage, and I went, what the fuck was that sentence that he just said? <laughs> it's like, fear is the mind killer. Like, oh, 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 let's get Doug! <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Rob and uh, Noah, back when uh, he was back in uh, Channel Awesome, would just, you know, bounce back uh, <laughs> Dune references, just not and not even connecting them with the, any of them. They're just spouting lines from the movie. And this used to piss Doug off so goddamn much that uh, he would... L- 
you know, it, it was only for the lack of God, he didn't just, uh, you know, spontaneously combust. And I figured like, well, you know, with that line, we should have him, we should have Doug kind of break character and all of a sudden exhibit, you know, his actual taste of Dune as uh, the nostalgia critic. And uh, I, <coughs> by the by, uh, very, very nice acting job here. Uh, but so when I got the red was when I got the footage back, one of the one of the lines that was not in the script that he screamed at the top of his lungs that I still don't quite remember where it came from. It's like, get your shoe shine box. Which yeah, I felt kind of completed from, the scene. Um, God, is it from Goodfellas? I think. <sighs> yeah, it's from it's from Goodfellas, and like some guy says it to Pesci. <clears throat> and I'll explain. Like I'll actually show you like what the definition of it is later. Now, back to commenting. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, I'm so, so much MGS. commentary in this commentary. Uh, of course, and the uh, the. Uh, Zoidberg bot, Zoid bot. Like here, like here's an interesting thing about about because um, we were talking about this like months ago. Mm -hmm. How men in anime, I think we even talked about this in our last uh, in our last commentary where we're talking about how men in anime used to look like men, and now obviously they don't. They just look like masculine girls. <clears throat> well, that and, guy just looks like meat jelly right now. But and you gotta wonder, you know, a generation that's grown up without. Uh, dudes in anime looking like this having facial hair mustaches beards etc you know being strong of jaw and big of shoulder you know like would they like would they care would like would they miss it if it was gone you know like not like would they miss their fey dudes if they were all gone and if all of a sudden you know like everybody looks like kenshiro again yeah i actually i actually brought that up to uh, mark a few months ago when i asked a very, very simple question when was the last time you saw a main character, not a supporting character, but a main character with a mustache in anime. And at first I was like, I went, well, Armstrong. No, Armstrong supporting. Shit. Yeah. I don't know. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like the, 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 the design sense of anime kind of went through the cycle where Japan was just aping off of America, both in terms of style and dress and also in terms of uh, film, because look at this. How could this not be, you know, <laughs> taking notes from Mad Max, which is not American, it's Australian. But, you know, it's like all the outside culture affecting Japan. And all of a sudden, it, it really didn't bring anything of its own identity to the table anymore. Like, if I, if I told you that this was animated on a shoestring budget in Australia, you might believe it, because this really doesn't look like anime. Not how we know it today. No, it's it's far less refined, and you know, but but I mean, so many shows were farmed out. So you know, we got like we got this look out of a lot of things, like Silverhawks, for instance. <laughs> uh, speaking of, oh, uh, uh, this was your joke right here. Uh, just yeah, to we you. we we caught some shit for this from Ego Raptor fans. Like, what do you ever like? You got a problem with Ego Raptor? No, we don't. It was a joke. Get over it. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, they're, I scru actually, they're, they're scrutinizing every little like every time we take a shot at something. Like, what do you have? Like, you have a problem with Spoonie? No, <laughs> we work with Spoonie. You'd think that if we had a problem, we wouldn't be working together. Like, I don't know. Like, I really don't know. Like, what conspiracy theorists are just kind of like sitting around, just trying to figure out like who hates who and why, and you know, like, are these jokes really like less than subtle barbs? And it's like, no, okay, because you know, because at, at the at the end of the day, you know, all of us usually are professional enough it's like yeah you keep that shit off the books yeah. so when we make a joke it's all in good fun except when it's john o'donnell <laughs> <laughs> that's only because john o'donnell's not really in the business anymore yeah so like whatever you know like whatever problems we have with john o'donnell which isn't which, so much about which ultimately what? we don't but really you want to know what it is it's that the man cashed out so he's got the last laugh because we're still working and he's not <laughs> You know, he was rich before he created Central Park Media. He's rich afterwards, and he indulged in his passion, which happened to be Asian culture. But yeah, we have no real problems with anyone we've ever made jokes with. I've actually met with uh, uh, Raptor once upon a time ago, and he was a cruel dude. And there's nothing like I bear no ill will. Like, usually, not, like, usually we don't make jokes about anybody cold. 
No, no. Especially not new media people. We don't make jokes about other new media people cold. Like, we usually know them. You know, A Bear, Bill, Eagle Raptor, you know, whoever. <clears throat> That's uh, that's uh, what uh, it's kind of like a balancing act, though, because sometimes you do want to like, oh, God, there's this great, sweet joke we can make here. But like, how will it affect the people that we know? And that's kind of like ugh. there's more than a few times we had to take out a joke or at least a reference because, you know, that person may not be working anymore. But that person knows people that are still working and might create some trouble somewhere down the line. Yeah, which, you know, ultimately is like, it's not that we're afraid of making jokes, and but we're also not fucking assholes. It's like, oh, come on, it's all in good fun. We totally, t like, made a really in bad taste joke about something we know that happened to you. No, it's just, you know, like, we make we make the jokes that are harmless and in good fun, and, like, whatever it is that you see one of those jokes, it's like, yeah, it's just in good fun, you know? Just take a, like, just take a poke, and ultimately, it's like, look, now there's Ego Raptor University. We can get miles out of that joke. <laughs> by the by can i like i love the fact that uh on that if you look back on that diploma it just says gabe just yeah <laughs> <sighs> but uh this is where i think the anime uh kind of lost its footing i mean at first it was kind of out there as it was but it was sort of like this gradual like okay post-apocalypse it's you know like a guy living in the wasteland just being baller badass okay then he turns then he just kind of turns heel for no real reason and now we have this other geist character uh i forgot his name of something oh, right. I, I don't have to, i don't have time to try to remember this guy's name but all of a sudden he's this savior of a, of a colony of humans that are trying to brave the wasteland but he's also a psychotic asshole too and you realize there really is no good character there's there is no hero to our anime, which may be the point, but you're kind of left wondering, what the hell are we supposed to root for if we're supposed to root for it at all? Oh, Krauser. That was his name, Krauser. Is his name Krauser or is that the guy from Fatal Fury? No, that's Krauser. Really? I re yeah, I remember because that was, uh, that's the name that uh, uh, that woman screams at her. Krauser, kill him! He's a demon! <laughs> Oh my god! I know it, there's only a so there's only so many German names the Japanese know. It's it's either Krauser or Geist. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, this the middle part of the second uh, second part of the anime was just this complete uh, clusterfuck of plot points meeting together somehow and not really affecting each other. Like the cyborg character remains completely baffling to me as far as why he is even here. He's just sent out to find him. He's injured, but he does find him, but then turns heel on him because this scientist character calls him an asshole for some reason. There, that's his complete arc. Like, honestly, it, like this whole thing just feels like, okay, so all of this is just, you made the fight first, didn't you? <laughs> you made the fight first and then realized, oh, crap, we don't have anything in the middle of any of this. Like, uh, Empty Guys 2 was made nearly, I want to say, seven years? At least seven years after the first one. Oh, I forgot he did that. <laughs> I forgot he tore off his flesh with his teeth. Anyway, but it was made about, like, seven years after the original Empty Guys, which means that you would think that the the director and anyone who worked on it learned from the experience. Yeah, this is where she screams out Krauser. <laughs> yeah, I just heard it. So uh, she, uh, you were hoping that uh, they would learn from their mistakes. And for the most part, they learned from their technical mistakes, but they haven't learned from their story writing mistakes. It's, and and no, more is it, no more is it apparent than the end of the anime where they realize that all the, uh, like all the robots that are feasting on human flesh are coming from one area of the desert and that they're going to detonate this nuclear bomb and they were going to detonate this nuclear bomb, but then for some reason or another, like they're invisible because of some like electronic signal. They said that they're that they're uh, giving off, but they're somehow interrupting it. And then that causes the insects to rampage. It's it's one of those times where you're just wondering, like, OK, what do you want us to feel? Do you want us to feel confused? Because you're doing a hell of a good job doing it. Well, that's that's just what happens when it is when you just have a big sandbox of apocalypse and 
that is like, okay, so we have our sandbox of apocalypse, and then we're going to throw the hero in, in, into that and a, and a couple of villains into that, and then all we have all of this extra sandy space. What do we do? Tropes. You know, Nothing, all, but... all of the things that led to the apocalypse. <laughs> Tropes. God. Uh, I feel like Geist could have been saved. I do feel like that, that could have been saved. Like, uh, Garzy's wing could not be saved. That was just top to bottom broken in all forms. Yeah, like, if, Geist... If, Geist, if Geist had an arc, if Geist were something other than, you know, this this walking murder machine that occasionally, you know, cracks a smile or does something that is unintentionally funny. Like, if he had an arc as an actual person, maybe that would have helped guide this. You know, and it wouldn't like, and it wouldn't have been such a blah experience. But you know, like, because every everything that makes this experience not blah is all the things that really you know sh it shouldn't be depended on to to make it interesting in the first place. You know, you shouldn't have to depend on the hyper violence. Like the hyper violence should be garnish. It shouldn't be like I'm eating all of this parsley and then there's one breadstick here. <laughs> Like I'd, I'd like the parsley with a side of breadsticks. That's that's what this is. There's absolutely no meat. Well, you know what? There is meat in the sense that there are action scenes. At least there are, you know, there are set piece moments that makes it memorable. Whereas Garzy's wing is just like this complete sea of stupidity and boringness and silliness. And there was absolutely nothing worthy of merit at least this was hysterical like this death scene especially like this is this is the sound of a guy nearly passing out in the booth is what this is <laughs> and the notion of a kid jumping up like nearly five feet to try and stop the blade for some reason yeah like never like never mind the spatial awareness that it takes in order to justify the scene as an animator <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean like when you point it out like, all right, even if it even if it was just like a momentary flash, even if it was just like a momentary flash of like, uh, like, oh, no, a kid got in the way. You still couldn't get over the fact like, wait a minute, where did that kid come from? And like, why is he suddenly here? And then it leads to this mother of all meltdowns. See, yeah, I, what, what made this what really makes this stand out and what we spent a lot of time talking about is that they didn't cut the gasping because they didn't have to because there's no flaps. So they just left in all of these instances where this dude is going to the mat in the booth and in between and in between cues, he's like, Bruh! yeah, that's one thing you never hear about. You never like most voice actors never get to do. They can't really reach that zenith of, you know, you are on the precipice of madness and you're just the slightest breeze will, you know, send you teetering off the edge as this character was supposed to portray. Because you're so, like, because you have to time the lip flaps and you have to keep the, the rhythm going. Yep, that's the skill of ADR. You just, it's pretty much from start to goal post and that's it. You're just hitting every one of your cues from post to post. So you don't really get to do stuff like that often. But, <clears throat> you know, it was really, it was really kind of jarring to, to hear this dude get to actually do some acting. But it's it was, you know, kind of undone by the fact it's like, okay, now there's too much gasping. <laughs> I, you know what it was? It was like, this guy was under, this guy was hired by CPM, which means he's had to give out the most dull, most writ performances possible. And now you get like, well, we don't have to time any lip flaps. You want to act? Yes! Yes! Like you've got 20 seconds of no flap. Go. <laughs> yes! Yes! Oh! Oh! I like to think that he was looking at a picture of John O'Donnell while he was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you to your grave. <laughs> and then here's and then the final admission, which was that this this anime was not like it's important because it's you know it's a uh, it's a propping post for the culture that we've developed and for the for the love of anime that we've grown, but. For all of its infamy, it is it is just a firework that fizzles at the end. It it didn't deserve nearly the amount of attention that it got, and still continues to get to this day for those of for those of us in the know. And it's sort of like you have to give it its due because people had gave it its, its attention, 
And uh, and I think that's uh, why I decided to give it its the 100th episode treatment as a sort of, uh, you know, it, it was a, it was an important piece to touch upon. And I feel like what more important piece, what how much how much more important could it be than be the subject of the 100th episode? And uh, this this a little montage right here was especially kind of um, was kind of touching for me personally while I was editing it because I got to see how I looked, you know, three years ago. And uh, not many people have actual record keeping of how they look almost every week for the past three years. It's like, wow, was I that that really? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I lost a ton of weight, didn't I? No, I went for this period of like I gained weight, then I lost weight and hopefully still losing weight. Oh, by, no, by is that real? No, that's apple juice. Ah, God damn it. <laughs> whenever you see liquor, whenever you see liquor on my show, it's not real. It's prop stuff. Damn. Well, you were hoping I would shotgun an actual fifth of scotch. Yes. <laughs> it's celebratory. God damn it. Well, here's the thing. If I screwed up that line, I would have to drink like <laughs> four or five of them in a row. And that's what keeps you on your fucking game. <laughs> and this is uh, Here's to the Future by George Sakalis playing us out, which is a great piece. Yeah, and uh, he was a great find for me personally. Uh, he contacted me on YouTube uh, some time ago. Uh, just you know, just wanted to say that he's a big fan of big fan of mine, and uh, that uh, he's uh, you know grateful about you know, grateful for the episodes and such. And uh, I actually had a chance to sit down and listen to some of the tracks that he wrote uh, over the years. And I was thoroughly, thoroughly impressed. And I contacted him about possibly doing some original music for the show. And he was all too happy to do it. And I think the show is quite better with his, uh, with his touch. It is. Cause now we've got the suave theme, which is all sorts of Ronnie Cordova. <laughs> uh, some people were sad to see the, uh, to see the old one go but sadly it had to it's copyright so like goddamn youtube yeah and what what are you gonna do uh also uh even though this gave out thanks to every one of the uh to uh, everyone on the patreon who donated enough i'd like to thank everyone who is a patron because you know whether how small or how large you gave you help support the show and help not only me but mark do what we do so you know, if this wasn't enough thanks, here's an, another group of thanks for for your generosity. Yep. There's two more episodes of Nuts and Bolts coming this month since we're taking a short break um, <clears throat> for Bennett's health, obviously. <laughs> so uh, be sure to look out for the next two episodes. And also, new episodes of Super Tool Shed on BenTheSage.com. Yep, that's uh, coming up sooner than later. We might have a special guest lined up, so keep your ear out for that. And uh, thank you all for your continued viewing, and thank you all for your continued patronage. Till next time. Take care. <laughs>